So it's, tw it's 08, 08, you're a seminary student. I am a lowly associate at Highland Park Methodist, <laughs> but we were gonna launch a new church in East Dallas and it happened to be here. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I was at a luncheon on campus and you, I don't know if you spoke or ask, ask a bunch of questions, but I remember asking Jim Mosier afterwards, who is that guy? Because you were articulate, <laughs> you were intelligent, and a little bit on the confident side. <laughs> and I said, no, I want to talk to that guy. So my point is, I, I think I called you, you came over, and I said, we're going to start a church in East Dallas. Do you remember that? And what were your first thoughts? Like, Yeah, I remember meeting in your old office. Yeah. Before you had the fancy office. <laughs> and um, we talked for a while. I, I don't mean to that meeting. I mean, we had... We probably visited for over a, a bunch year. of times. Yeah, yeah, a ton of times before Munger was uh, specifically here. It, you know, remember you were thinking of the theater over yeah. there and all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. And I think one of the things was we had um, we were both interested in kind of the um, ideas of Andy Stanley in Atlanta and yeah. this kind of stuff. So I think we had similar language, I think. Yeah, I remember that. In terms of church plant. Yeah, church planting. And and if you're going to reach people who don't come to church, you're going to need to do something that nobody else is currently doing or, or not right. many people or whatever. So I remember that. I remember um, just just being interested in to hear from you. I mean, when you're in seminary, you don't talk to pastors very often. So I was like, well, this is interesting. You know, <laughs> and it was easy. Right, I could just walk on over. You know, Did you want? Were, were you interested in planting churches at that time? Yeah, you, yeah, for sure. Saying, I, um, and then we came over here, as you referenced a minute ago. We were going to do this in a theater, yeah, an old movie theater in East Dallas. It's now a grocery store, uh, but from a stewardship standpoint, we came by here and we thought well, it doesn't make any sense to go invest a bunch of money in a theater when right here, there's a church that's already paid for by somebody, and it's just about to close up and become a CVS. And so, as blessing or fate or whatever you want to articulate it as would have it, the conference gave us the building. We said, let's do Munger. Do you remember the first day we walked in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this <laughs> point, the old Munger um, had uh, closed. Uh, so there's no congregation meeting. Correct. So there was um, like security fencing up, no electricity. <laughs> it was like in twilight. And it was, it really was. We're not exaggerating. It was like where a zombie movie could have been. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. There's like trash around, like like people had just been sucked away or whatever. You, you expecting to hear like somebody coming, dragging his feet after you. It was kind of scary. When you walked around that day, what, what were you what were you thinking? I think I don't think I had the same vision that you did in terms of seeing it vibrant. I think I I I'm not good at interior <laughs> decoration. I can't see. I can't see like decorating, like add this color, add this accent. And I think you were like, this is gonna be this. And to me it just looked like it was dead. It just looked dead. <laughs> so I remember thinking that. I remember thinking that there it was big, like it like had a big feel to it. And there's no people here, which seems strange. So I felt potential there. Also, you know, got to remember the neighborhood has changed a lot yeah. in the last 12 and 13 years. Just it's just changed. So it's a different kind of neighborhood then too. And you know, there's security fencing around the place for a reason. You know, yeah. to kind of protect it. So I think I was more like kind of freaked out by it. Over time, you kept you know playing the Pied Piper <laughs> flute. I'm like, all right, let's do this. I remember it was. Um, it was the summer of 2009. I distinctly remember I was in uh, Virginia on vacation and you called and, and it, either you offered me the job or you were following up on an offer. I can't remember. I remember talking to my wife, like, are we going to do this? We're not going to do this. I, I distinctly remember that for sure. And just weighing the pluses and minuses of it. Was Elaine worried early on? Yeah, she was. I think she, um, I think she also just thought like, well, what are we doing? How's this going to work? I think she was, like most wives, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing something stupid, you know. Uh, so, and I, I like to remind her of that. She's usually right. But that was one time when I said, I think we need to do this. I think this is going to be cool. And of course, I had no idea how true that statement was, but yeah. I just thought it at the time. Yeah. Also, I like the idea that you were willing to try a new thing and were going to give a ton of space to a young leader like me. That was attractive. And so you're also sort of like, well, I could go, I'm exaggerating here. I could go you know, put a suit on work in corporate, so to speak, mm -hmm. or we could do this new kind of church type thing. Well, in my personality, I'd rather do that. So we, you know, back in the day, we invested a lot of intentionality and probably money to fix it up, get the building ready. We walk in here, it's initially set up as a video venue. You're yeah. going to be the campus pastor. You're going to host, be relational, teach midweek stuff. But I was going to do all the preaching by video. 
How many Sundays were you here before you thought, I, I, I'm ready to preach? We need to unplug the video. Yeah. Well, let me say this. I don't know if you remember, but I will never forget our first Sunday. It was in October, and it was just awesome. Yeah, like, it, was it was awesome. Just, like, God just blessed it. And I have had so many moments like that that are just so sweet, so good. Like, I'll never forget them. So the first Sunday was amazing, and I was just glad to be involved in it. I just felt like this is going to be awesome. Um, I also always knew, though, that I wanted to preach. Uh, I wanted to learn how to do it, and you just got to do it. So um, I, first Sunday, pumped how things were. But, <laughs> but how do you second do it? Sunday, yeah. wait a minute. No, 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 that's not true. The second <laughs> Sunday, I thought we wouldn't have any people. See, it took me about six months or even a year. Maybe I'm not totally over it yet. I thought the first Sunday, place is full. Second Sunday, it's half. Half, half, and in three weeks, you know, there'll be 10 people here and we'll have to close at Christmas. That's what I thought. <laughs> I just was like, all right, when's the other shoe going to drop? Because I know how most of these things fail, you yeah. know? So I, I, didn't, I didn't trust enough or whatever. And then as things get rolling and all, and, and I, think I, you know, I think I preached on Christmas and maybe on Easter or something, I thought, this is fun. I want to try to do this. So I, I, remember, we, I remember we were driving around uh, in the car, you and I, and we talked about it some. Yeah. Um, so, but it probably, it, I didn't know what I was doing either. Like you have to learn these things and you can only learn by doing. At an institutional church, they've probably had bad preaching at different times. Everybody's like, we survived that. But in a new place, you might fall apart. So it was a good, it was a good yeah. lunch pad for me. Margin for errors on a new church plan is not, not a lot of forgiveness in there in the early days. But. No, and, and one of the things that um, you, you wanted to do, we had the financial backing to do, was you know those um, paper airplanes, which you hold um, like a stick with a rubber band and then you pull the plane back and you like launch it? Yep. That's basically what happened here. Uh, and that, I don't think we can ever underestimate that. Listen, God has blessed our socks off from the beginning. But, but also he blessed what was, he blessed the year vision and the work that uh, was put into it before I even came on just to kind of let the thing go as fast and as far yeah. as possible. That's a big deal. I remember coming down, I think it was, it was in Advent. It was just before Christmas. And I think you called and said you wanted to do a special Advent sermon service i bet it was because of the marathon and you said you wanted to do a special standalone advent service could you could you do it well of course and ashley and i came down and just attended we weren't observing we just wanted to get away from working the church and go worship so we're like let's go to munger we love munger so we came down here and we literally got back in the car right out of the parking lot and i said we have clipped this young man's wings it's time for him to we we gotta let him go i said he's gotta preach I said, no, we're not waiting anymore. I think I called you the next week and said, start January 1 or you know, yeah. early January, away you go. Uh, and immediately you begin to put your own stamp on it. You'd already done that, um, but you begin to put your own stamp on it and to really, really um, lead. But what it was, when you start a church and you got this core body of people, what was the most exciting thing for you about what you as a leader could do as a shepherd? I think what was most exciting for me was the idea that there wasn't there wasn't, the thing didn't exist. You're going from zero to one. Yeah. It wasn't there. There's a lot of stress that comes with that. The example I always use, it's kind of dumb, but at every other church in America, there's a bunch of people that buy the communion bread and they've been buying it for the last hundred <laughs> years. Nobody ever thinks about it. You show up, who buys it? Miss Gladys buys the communion bread, right? And a new thing, nobody does that. And so there's stress on that. Like, well, where's the communion bread? Our first Christmas Eve, I distinctly remember like, Oh my gosh, we better get candles. And I probably, you know, went to the bookstore and bought them the day before, right? You don't think about it. So there's that. But on the other hand, the potential for a thing that wasn't to be from zero to one is so awesome and so fun. I think that's what I, I like the best. And also, you know, one of the reasons I went into ministry was because I wanted to be able to shape church life. Because yeah. I love church and I wanted to be able to do that. And so to be able to, the opportunity to do that was cool. That's been good. Well, you've gone from showing up on Sunday thinking we're not going to be able to open the doors next week. You may still have some of that residually in your psyche, but uh, clearly now, numerically, by any definition, it's a highly successful church. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you attribute that to? Yeah. And it's funny, in Dallas, people come from these huge, huge, huge churches. They come here like, oh, I like, I'm ready to go to a small church. And our sanctuary is smaller than the size of the church too. But as you and I know, Munger is a pretty large church compared to most churches in America, mm-hmm. right? But it just seems small um, around here. W- w- why are people coming? I think uh, the timing, I-, I don't think you can ever overestimate the whole timing thing. Hmm. Right place, right time. 
on, on so many levels. I think uh, our churches flowering here has been part of the flowering of the neighborhood, if I'm honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think part of having a vibrant faith community here, you know, it's like it's like the ecosystem things. You know, you plant one tree and it affects the whole deal, right? So I, I think I think having the church right place, right time has been one of the reasons why the neighborhood is kind of on the up. But then the neighborhood is also on the up, which helps the church. So I think right, right place, right time. Um, lots, lots of young families are moving in. Uh, you know, you and I know colleagues who whatever are in small Texas towns that are 10,000 people less than they had 40 years ago. It's just hard to have that same kind of vibrant sense of people moving in that we have fortune to have here. So this is the overall dynamism of North Texas, of Dallas, I think helps. I think the fact that, um, I already said this, that we launched big, you know, folks at Highland Park literally gave millions of dollars to allow this thing to kind of really go hard. Mm -hmm. We're not going to just, there's a phrase you like to use, uh, at least internally with the staff, <laughs> uh, no rinky dink, right? right? We, we were trying not to start rinky dink. We're going to start big. If we're going to fail, we're going to flame out. But we weren't just going to kind of eke along. So I think the, the money to start well, have the place renovated, make it look good, have the right staff in place. I think that right place, right time. Also, I think in the last uh, dozen of years, you and I have talked to lots and lots of churches that want to do something similar. And uh, they almost all make a couple fundamental mistakes. We'll tell them, I say, I don't think you should do that. And they do it anyway. <laughs> so there's two big ones. Number one. They try to put new wine in an old wineskin. Mm -hmm. They try to keep the existing culture. Unfortunately, the old congregation that was here, very faithful people, lots of ministry over the years, very complicated story, but in the last years was not capable of being a functioning church. Um, and instead of being honest about that, a lot of places just try to incorporate the new thing in, in, in with the old, and that never works. So, so the very clear idea coming from you, hey, the old thing is going to close. And it closed you know, 18 months before we started. Yeah. There. That's huge. That was big. Huge. Probably maybe the biggest decision, honestly. And then secondly, nobody at Holland Park has ever, one single time, this is amazing, uh, this is probably due to the Reverend Mark Craig's leadership coming before, before you, has ever um, begrudged Munger, regretted mm -hmm. it, right? Everybody I ever talked to, you know, originally, you know, I went around all the Sunday school classes, shook the tree, talked to as many people as possible, <laughs> right? They're all like, oh, this is great. We're so fired up. We're so proud of this. So the fact that we were coming out of a church that was ready to push and was all behind it, I think that's really big. In other words, mm -hmm. there's no division yeah. in the culture. So right place, right time, a culture of, of, of generosity, of abundant generosity, uh, making a clean break. I think all those reasons really made a difference. Was there a Sunday or a, it could have been a midweek, an event, a Christmas event, something where you knew, okay, it's, it's turned, we're, we're going to make it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think for me, it would be... Um, no, I don't think there was a moment. I think a couple of years into it, when we started doing Easter and making it a bigger deal, and we had more people than you could possibly fit, it was like, wow, this is really kind of work. like creeps up on you. This is going to work. For a long time, even after the numbers said otherwise, I was always like, well, we're probably two weeks away from closing the doors. <laughs> That's just my personality. Well, people don't know that we live with that. I know. I know. They think I you know. live on the opposite end of the confidence yeah. meter when really you think this is my last Sunday. Nice I'm you. done. Yeah. Uh, it's nice <laughs> knowing you. Uh, so it took, it took a while. Um, and then, of course, you have the opposite problem, which you know about all too well, which is like, it sounds great to have people wanting to come to church, but if you don't have parking for them or seats for them, yeah. it's actually really stressful. Thank you, Lord. This is the problem we would rather have, but it's still <laughs> kind of stressful, you know, <laughs> yeah. in an urban, an urban infill area to have people come to church and not fit them all is a stressful problem. We try to park them up this road in a restaurant and bust yeah. them. In. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Um, you mentioned something a second ago that's important. A, a church should have an impact on the neighborhood. This church has absolutely had an impact on this neighborhood. What are some areas where you've seen that manifested in them? I think one thing is, and I, and I don't think we can overestimate um, the importance of the church being a refuge for people, of hmm. just joy. Right? Like, like so many things are such a beatdown all the time in people's lives. You know, nobody encourages them at work. And, and they turn on the social, they open social media, they turn on the television, it's just ugly, 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 negative, negative, negative. Having a place that's like a refuge to come and people like smile at you and mm -hmm. say your name and the music is uplifting. That alone, I mean, listen, you know me, I am uh, i don't want to be uh, superficial only. I want to have substance, right? This is, we're talking, we're preaching the gospel here, right? Mm -hmm. However, just the superficiality of, of smiles and kindness and positivity is huge. 
Do I think one thing, this is my favorite thing, a place of positivity and of joy on a Sunday, just refuge. I think it's huge. You can come and you can sit and you just feel good. I, I, I never want to under, underestimate that. I think the other thing um, that this place has been is just bringing life to the neighborhood, hmm. just physically people being around. You know, uh, a city is unsafe when there aren't. Jane Jacobs talked about uh, eyes on the street makes the city sick. You know, the kids hmm. aren't playing. And so just the fact people are coming here makes ch- changes it. Like their physical movement yeah. changes. Critical and then, of course, the park. Uh, you know, it's a park that had no friends, I like to say. And our, our, our folks from our church founded, separate from the church, a Friends of, of Garrett Park Foundation. And we've given money to a new playground. We've had services out there. That helps. It's like, a, it's like a front porch of the church, I think. So just this physical activity has made a real difference to the neighborhood, I think. What, uh, you know, we, we, the, the initial outlay was to kind of really do the sanctuary proper. But since then, y'all have done tons of stuff on your own. What, what are you most proud of in terms of giving new life to the building? Besides the sanctuary. You know, it's funny. I'm most proud of a parking lot, which sounds weird. Yeah. So there were some boarding houses, neighboring boarding houses built at some point in the church's past. And uh, they weren't good places. And we tried for years to get in touch with the owner who lived an hour out of town. And finally, one of our guys drove down and attached an offer letter to her gate. And she called us up. And we needed to raise, uh, I think, $2 million in cash in like two months, real short. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the congregation was smaller than this is a big reach. Yeah. And I was sure we were supposed to go for it, but I wasn't at all sure it would work. And that's now it seems like who cares? But as a leader, you don't want to fail on this kind of stuff. And you you stand up in front of people, say, we need to do this. And that doesn't work. You're you you feel exposed. I remember feeling like that. But we got the money, we got the cash, the, the the thing came down. Here's why that matters. That that was first of all a domino for a bunch of other real estate things that happened. Mm-hmm. That was the first one. It's so obvious that, that was the first thing that needed to fall. But during the pandemic, we had outdoor services in that parking lot, which would not have been possible if two years before yeah. they hadn't come down. So it was like God knew all along, that's the first domino, man. You got to step out in faith. You got to trust. And the outdoor services during COVID were a big deal for us. You, know, you can spread out, do whatever you want. And and I can see now God's hand kind of guiding that. I'm, it sounds funny, but I'm most proud of that parking lot. What's been the hardest thing? I mean, twin. 12 years now, I mean, you've joy, a lot of joy, lots and lots of successes and victories, but what's been some hard stuff or stuff you didn't anticipate that you just thought, ooh? A, a couple of hard things for me. One is um, it's hard to know how best to help people in serious poverty. The neighborhood is changing, but we still have homeless folks mm-hmm. who sleep around here and we're friends with them and live in the park. And, and how, how do you really help them in a way that helps and doesn't hurt? And to know that there are problems you can't fix, that's, that's a burden. Because I, I want to solve a problem and I wish it were, well, we'll just do this and then we'll solve the problem. So that just feeling yeah. a burden for that. A lady, uh, we spoke about living in the parsonage just last week. A lady came to our gate, back gate. I was outside and started talking to us and I had to end up helping her. And you always feel like you don't know how best to do it. So right. that, that's, that's a hard thing. Uh, I, think, um, I think for me personally, the hardest thing is preaching every week, as you know. It's just unbelievably difficult. I like doing it. It's fun, but I'm sure you feel the same way. There's basically not a Sunday morning where I don't go, man, I'm glad I'm preaching today. And there's not a Saturday night when I go, I wish I weren't preaching tomorrow. I'm not ready. You know, <laughs> Every you week. Up when you're not ready. Every seven days, I feel this one. I know. No. I know. I always say these comedians and, and politicians, they have speech writers and they give the same speech over and over. Over and over. We have to do the new one every week. Every night, every seven days. People have no idea. They have no idea. Somebody so, asked me once if, if, I had a con, if I was on contract at the church. I said, yeah, it lasts seven days. Yeah. I said, I'm on a seven day rollover and they decide on Monday if they're going to renew it or not. That's it. The best thing is at 12.01 p.m. on a Sunday, it doesn't matter if it's the best sermon that's been preached since the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't matter. You just start over again. <laughs> you know. So that's hard. And... Um, I think what's also hard is to maintain the church as a refuge and not get dragged into the various currents. Everybody wants mm-hmm. you to kind of be involved in current events, and current events matter. I mean, it's our life. But the church um, can't be dragged into the same current as everybody else. We've got to stand apart from that. It's really hard to do that. Everybody wants you to speak about whatever their issue is. That's hard. It's hard to maintain that. Well, as you well know, one of our five kind of key, we call them pillars, values, priorities, however you want to phrase them. But one of our top five priorities is the development of the next generation of leader. 
And you could not have known that, even though we probably told you, but you could not have known what that meant when you first got here. But how are you different now as a leader today, 12 years in, than you were when you walked in the door? On well, one, and um, talk about right place, right time. You gave me an opportunity. A lot of people don't get opportunities. And so the very fact that I had an opportunity, I don't think we can overstate just what that meant. I could have ended up anywhere. I ended up here with this amazing runway and the, the energy behind it and the rubber band being pulled back, ready to go. That was big. So, so the opportunity alone just changed everything for me. Then I think things no longer are theoretical, but they're real for you. You know, I came out mm -hmm. of seminary with all kinds of theoretical ideas. And like everybody <laughs> oh, yeah. in seminary, I knew, I knew everything, you know? Yeah, One everything. Thing, everything. One thing for me is uh, I no longer want to plan things top down. Everybody needs to do everything like this. Pray like this, do it like this. I'm much more like, here's what I think but I'm gonna let you make your own adult decisions. Mm. It's, much, it's much more freeing like that. You can try to micromanage everything in the church. And now I'm just more like, hey, okay, let's, let's, let's go and let the Lord work. So I'm much more um, willing to kind of live and everything not being neat and clean, more messy. And uh, it's, it's terms, in terms of church leadership and ministration. Uh, I've also learned a lot more about the Bible and really come to love it. That's been a big change for me. That's probably the biggest change. If you'd asked me 12 years ago, is the Bible cool? Do you like the Bible? I would have said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I probably thought I was supposed to say that. Yep. Now I like really love it. Yeah. And that's changed. It's even changed in the last five years. That's been a big change, which has been fun. There, there is this sentiment, I think, or a belief, it's a myth, that, that those of us that come out of seminary are fully formed. Yeah. And you have all, you know everything there is to know about the Bible or about spirituality or about small group work or about anything. You're just forming yourself. Yeah. And it's it's tough because you, you don't want to convey that you're still forming, but to be transparent, you were totally for me. Um, and then you know, a lot of times, someone like yourself that's really talented, your reputation will be out in front of your maturity. I don't think that was the case for you. I think your maturity and your reputation were, were parallel and they still are. Uh, you know, they developed alongside of each other, but uh, that's a great point because everybody thinks we're fully formed yeah. and we're, we're, we're just not. You know, as we dip into tomorrow or step into tomorrow, uh, you've been here 12 years. And what are the things other than the parking lot that you're, you're most proud of that your legacy, the legacy of Andrew Forrest, when people look back 50 years from now and say, you know, back in the day, there was a guy named Andrew. Yeah. What, what do you hope they say about that? One thing that I'm really proud of is uh, worship on Sundays. I love that our place just feels happy, hmm. just feels happy. People are happy to be here. I, I mean, I push real hard. You come to church every week. You come to church. But like church for us is joyful. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I, that's really important to me. And it's not um, fake. I feel that. Our leaders feel that. People feel that when they come in. My sense of like, this is a great thing. This is a gift that God is giving us today. I'm really proud that I think that's true about us here. If you come on Sunday, you'll feel like everybody's kind of happy to be there. I really love that. That makes it really important to me. I think I've really been trying to get people to really read the Bible, not just talk about it. For sure. Uh, that's a big one for me. Uh, I'm convinced that that's probably the biggest weakness of the American church. We're totally biblically illiterate. I was biblically illiterate. I'm becoming more illiterate now as I'm learning and trying to model that. Those two things are really important to me. One is vibrant worship that's just fun. I think we should use that word. Worship yeah. should be fun. And then I think, you know, we're also trying to raise people up to love the Bible. Those are two things that I hope stay after when I'm gone. I remember getting some kind of a flyer from you guys that said, eat this book. And I thought, what in the world have they gotten into down at Munger? Yeah. <laughs> what is this? I remember calling you saying, what is the eat yeah. the book campaign? And then it was clear to me that you guys had made a pivot and were really diving in deep and, and trying to get the congregation to buy into what does it mean to immerse yourself in the scripture? Yeah. Um, you know, just a lot of churches are, are really good at preaching and hearing the word, teaching the word, and not so good at living the word. I think you guys get the balance right. What, what are some areas where this church is living the word? I talk a lot about how love goes first. And what I mean by that is it's always the loving situation and the loving thing to do in any situation to move, to move toward the other person. Um, that we all, so if you're at the grocery store and the clerk says, sir, how, how you doing today? And you pause, you're, you're busy, you're looking at your phone and you slow down and you go, oh, I'm doing okay. It just changes things. And that's true from every interaction. When people show mm. that they care about you, it really changes how you feel about things. Um, and of course, this is biblical. John, 1 John chapter 4, we love because God first loved us. Mm -hmm. So responding to love is really important. Love is kind of a sappy word in our culture, unfortunately. 
I like to say that to love is to will the good of the other, quoting St. Thomas Aquinas. And so one thing I've really tried to talk a lot about is what does it look like for you to let love go first, to go first at work, to move first towards your colleagues. Hey, hey, how you doing, Mac? Good morning. How you doing, Susan? Or, or if, there's, if you'd be the first one to forgive or the first one to ask for forgiveness, man, I really screwed that up. Uh, and you can, that applies everywhere in life, with your kids, work, your neighbor, et cetera. That's a big one for me, uh, going first like that. I think the other thing is, as I've talked about, I really want our folks to bring, um, sounds Bible, I want them to bring Eden blessings where they go, be hmm. a conduit for Eden, Eden blessing. We've done some prison ministry, and prison is rough, man, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I always tell our guys, all you need to do is just be positive, just smile, all, just bring light in there. They don't believe you do that. No, they don't believe you. No. <laughs> I think they got to say something the right thing. You don't. Yeah. You, and, you, and so teaching our people, like, you can carry God's blessing when you go to work or at the pool or in the TSA line, something like that. That's a big one for me. In other words, I think it's not that the big grand projects are unimportant. They're very important. But often we overlook just the everyday interaction. And I know that you have people in your life the way I do that you just want to be around them because they're so positive. I'm not that person naturally. I want to be, and I want to lead our people to be like that. Yeah. Well, somebody's going to look at this interview one day and say, man, 90% the, the of the video is, is about how amazing the church is and about your value and your contribution to it. Uh, but you're leaving. <laughs> so as Andy Stanley says, you know, sometimes uh, the hard thing or the God thing is to, to leave when it would be easier to stay. Uh, clearly, it'd be easy for you to stay, but you're, you're, you're going to... What, where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to a church called Asbury uh, Church. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Out of nowhere, left field, a search firm called me a long time ago. And I said, um, it's going to be very unlikely. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Uh, you know, I'm at a point in my life where you just kind of feel like it's time to pivot. You just mm -hmm. kind of at that point. And so I'm happy to talk to anybody, but it's going to be like an amputation. And I kept talking and I talked to you about it way early on. And one of the things you said was, you need to walk the process because either the door will slam shut mm -hmm. and it'll give you clarity or it won't slam shut. And ultimately it came down to it. I just felt like I knew what I was supposed to do, but I didn't want to do it because I felt like if I said, Lord, I trust you. He's going to say, okay, you need to go here. And I didn't want to leave because <laughs> I'm going to a cool place, a great place. And I'm making the decision to go, but also to stay is it has my heart, right? Yeah. So the reason I'm going really very clearly is as afraid as I am to go, uh, I am more afraid to stay when I shouldn't stay. Mm. I'm really wow. afraid, man. I'm really afraid to go. I can step in a new place where there's existing people. Most of the people here came, either they're part of our launch team or they've come since I've been here. So mm -hmm. I, they, I learned their names over time and, and they came and if they don't like me, they don't come, right? Whereas if you go to a new place, Thousands of people who don't know you, but they knew the old pastor. Like, it's out of my comfort zone in every way, every way. But I'm afraid of staying put if I'm not supposed to stay. Because as we talked about, God has blessed this place here. Yeah. And ministry has been like moving um, butter on a frying pan, smooth. And I'm really afraid of overstaying when God's saying, man, you're supposed to go, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's ultimately the reason. And it's hard to say goodbye, but I have to trust that God has a good thing for it. For everybody, everybody involved. If... Uh, if we act in faith and act obediently, it's going to bless everybody in some way. Yeah, leaving when it'd be easier to stay is really one of the hard things to do. What, uh, what, are, what are you going to miss? What are you going to miss the most? Well, uh, my kids were born here. We had some pretty serious medical issues with my wife. We thought she was going to die here. And people just love the heck out of us. Hmm. So, I mean, just the individual people that just are so kind. They have been so kind forever. Sometimes, you know, I know churches could be toxic or people could be mean to the pastor or whatever. I don't, I don't think this is your experience and it's definitely not my experience. It's the opposite. Yeah. People are too kind. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> just have the kindness and the, and the encouragement and they pray for me. Just that is huge. I'm going to miss Texas. I'm going to like you, I'm an adopted Texan. Yep. You know, my favorite restaurant is Bucky's. Yeah, you know, uh, I even have not one, but two pairs of cowboy boots. The Texas state fair is my favorite religious holiday, you know, uh, to leave that's going to be hard. Uh, and I, I love our city and, and all this. So I think leaving home, honestly, leaving home is going to be hard. Yeah. Um, I also know that you grow when you leave and you have to. And, and I'm trusting Ooh. God for that. 
Well, you've always modeled complete and absolute trust of God's will, even if it's uncomfortable. And so I'm sure the dis-ease of leaving here is, is real, but uh, no doubt you're going to do incredible things. You know, one thing I ask you what, what you're going to miss the most. Uh, w- one thing about developing great leaders is you develop great leaders and then they're desired. <laughs> and, and that's hard. Uh, just as it's sometimes difficult to leave when it'd be easier this, to stay, it's also easier just to have mediocre staff that nobody ever wants. And so the moment we got a call about you, it's, it's bitter, sweet, because you think, no, yeah. you know, we don't want to lose Andrew. Um, but it's part of what it means to develop great leaders. We have people that are desired. And so my real hope is that you, you're continuing to be blessed. I, your leadership, as you get transplanted into the new church, is going to just take off. And I really think you're going to have a much bigger platform even than you've had here. And God willing, uh, you got gigantic, we have gigantic shoes to fill with your absence. It's a big, giant divot in our world. Hopefully we'll be able to fill it. And so keep us in your prayers. I know we're going to be doing the same for you. And this is home for you. So we hope you'll be around more than we probably hope. But uh, we love you, man. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, it's been an unbelievable run. And I can't wait to see the next chapter in your life and in Longer's.